Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Kirshner, Museum Director here at the Skirball, and we're delighted so many of you could be here with us this afternoon for a very special occasion and a most special speaker, someone very special to us. Uh, I would like to, first of all, remind you that our galleries are open until 7 p.m. tonight so that after the presentation, we hope you will want to take in the exhibition that doesn't open to, until, to the public until Tuesday morning, but you have the chance to see it today. Global Citizen, uh, the architecture of Moshe Safdi. I'm sure after today's presentation, that will be an especially attractive option for the rest of your afternoon. Um, I'd like to extend uh, greetings to uh, uh, our Skirball Board of Trustees, we're delighted to have so many of you here today. Our, our chairman, Howard I. Friedman. I would also like to ask uh, one gentleman to uh, stand and take a bow, the curator of the Global Citizen Exhibition, Donald Albrecht. Donald. And it's my most... Uh, um, grateful duty to introduce someone so special to all of us here, our president and uh, CEO, the founder of the Skirball Cultural Center, Uri Hersher. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Can you imagine that this was once a dump? <laughs> and believe me, some people said, it's gonna remain a dump. Yes, actually, it's a dump as a dump. And some people came around and said, no, no, we see a vision. And uh, you're about to hear from the visionary, the architect. The world's uh, greatest architects are not only designers and builders, but as I said, visionaries and dreamers. Moshe Safti stands very tall in this company, and taller still in his commitment to humanistic and communal values. He has been the Skirball Cultural Center's architect from its inception 30 years ago, when indeed this was a dump. He's given it shape, not only to this sublimely beautiful campus, but he's given shape to our voice, our character, and our mission. And it is for this reason that this is particularly meaningful to me, that the Skirball should have the honor, the honor of presenting the U.S. debut of Global Citizen, hello to you too. <laughs> global Citizen, the architecture of Moshe Safdi, a spectacular exhibition spanning only four decades of Moshe's extraordinary vision and achievement. I have had the privilege of witnessing firsthand more than three three of those four decades. I've seen for myself the principles and the values that guide your work, Moshe. Each of his projects, I should say each of your projects, is remarkable in its own unique way. But all share the inspiration of a rare genius and a humane sensibility. I met Moshe in Jerusalem in the 1970s, it was, so to speak, love at first sight. It certainly helped that both of us were born in Israel, spoke the same language, were close in age, and shared many of the same formative experiences. Over the years, we have formed a bond of trust, a bond of caring, that is only strengthened and deepened with time. With that, friendship has come an ever-deepening appreciation of his work, 
talking about as though he's not in a room, of your work. Here at the Skirball, we inhabit it every single day. We never tire of its beauty. We don't tire of its integrity, its hospitality, its humanity. And it is the last attribute that I prize above all. Moshe cares about people. He cares about the environment, the environment we all inhabit, and how it can enhance our experience of one another. I'm going to switch from his to your. Your architecture is an embrace. It expresses in all of its forms a profound respect of human relationship, community, and dignity. That is why your buildings are not only admired, for us, they are loved. Moshe Safti has become, indeed, a global citizen. Your buildings, Moshe, are now cherished as cultural landmarks throughout this world. They testify to your unique gifts as an architect. Yet those gifts transcend the realm of architecture. They speak to and lift high the human spirit. How proud, how grateful I am to introduce our architect, and my friend, our friend, Moshe Safti. My dear Uri, you always leave me speechless. And your words always humble me because they raise expectations of myself. But I think you will summon from this introduction that the Skirball Center was created out of friendship and love and cooperation in a, in a spirit of harmony, which is pretty rare in the architectural experience and profession. It's very moving for me to be here today, 30 years after we stood on that garbage dump and said, this place could be an oasis. Let's make it an oasis. And I would reflect just for a moment on the whole question of client and architect. In, uh, in the jargon of the profession, the importance of architect is rarely uh, the importance of the client is rarely uh, uh, emphasized. In the old days, we used to talk of the pa patrons, of the Medicis, and so on. And they actually, the patrons got a fair amount of credit uh, for the masterpieces that emerged. And I think in this day and age, cultural personality, one forgets, buildings are the result of collaboration, and the good buildings require great, uh, great clients. And Uri, you have been an exemplary client, and it's been extraordinary joy to work together. I'm also very moved to be here on the occasion of the opening of the exhibition, and very happy that Skirball, uh, together with Crystal Bridges, and with the sponsorship of the Skirball Foundation, and the Fa uh, Walton Family Foundation, has sponsored this exhibition. And I'd like to thank Don, uh, Donald for being the curator, Donald Albrecht for being the curator of this show and taking it on, and in fact, coining the term global citizen. I'm going to change my name now. <laughs> um, I thought it would be appropriate to, today, given the opening of the exhibition, to try and give a kind of an overview, uh, rather than focus on one aspect of my work. Uh, I'm often asked, uh, given the, that wide variety of projects, wide variety of geographies, 
what is the common denominator, the common thread in your work? Uh, what connects it? And uh, there is an easy answer. The easy answer is there are, there's a set of principles. There's a set of principles which I deeply believe in, and they guide me from project to project. And then once you say there are principles, the question is, well, what, what are these principles? And I say, well, there's a kind of an ethic, a sort of I believe about what architecture has to be, what it is answerable to. Um, and that immediately implies, well, if you have an ethic, one can evaluate architecture, one can measure it, one can respond to it and see to what extent it responded to its purpose. Um, and again, within the easy answer, I say, well, there's a few principles that I think are common to all my buildings. First, I believe that architecture is a material, it is material, it is, a, it is tectonic, we build with materials. It is not painting, it is not sculpture. We, the language of architecture is a language of building. And that means that we craft a building with the means available to us. And that the structural systems and the mechanical systems and all the things that make up a building are the language of its poetry. And we walk into a Gothic cathedral and we look and we see the flying buttresses and the piers and the structure and we feel the place in terms of its materiality. When that is not present, it's stage set. You're in Disneyland. You don't need to have materiality in Disneyland because it is a stage set. But also it means that architects are responsible for the resources that they consume in creating an environment. Energy, actual materials. Today we call it green architecture, sustainable. We believed in these things much before these words were coined and became fashionable. And that sense of economy, not in being cheap, not in, not in building less, but building more with less, is a deep principle of, I think, all significant architecture. But then at the end, material things are not the object of architecture, which is a place to be in, a shelter, a house, a school. And so the program of a building, uh, I like to call it, the life intended in the building is to me a deep issue in terms of how architecture responds to that. Louis Kahn, with whom I had the good fortune to apprentice with, used to say, let the building be what it wants to be. And it seems to, be, seems to me that in that phrase, he captured that sense of a building having a program, having its own will. So if you design a school or if you design a campus like the Skirball, um, nobody's going to be interested what theories you were into or what isms or whether that was postmodernism or deconstructivism or whatever. They're just going to actually at the base level ask, is that a wonderful school? Is that a wonderful museum? Is that a wonderful place for the community in terms of people's experience? And that leads me to a third aspect that I think is central to my work, which is the significance of place and the uniqueness of a program. Uh, circumstances have been that my work has been dispersed geographically. I would say that's also the circumstance of my life that I've been dispersed geographically, but also in terms of my projects. And in time, that became to inform the work because building in Canada, and then building in Jerusalem, and then building in China, and in Singapore, and in Mexico, and in Senegal. These places had very unique cultures, technologies, and the sites had unique properties. And I came to realize that you cannot just take your own bag of tricks and just apply it no matter where you were, that there was information that came from the place information about site, about the culture of a site. And these, uh, if you were open to these, if your antennas were out, the architecture would begin to transform in response to place. And at the end, that meant that you were able to build building in places which are strange to you, but which those living there would have, to use Uri's word, a love for that building. And so this essence of place, again, is something that informs my work. And then there are, of course, many themes, the obsession with daylight. I guess I'm a 
maniac about the importance of daylight. There's the, the desire to transform every program into metaphorically uh, the sense of a garden. But these are themes that carry between project to project. At the end, the work is a combination of these principles as well as how a place has informed the project. Having said all of that, it is not a recipe for creating significant architecture. You can checklist the, uh, the, the themes I just spoke about, and yet it might or might not have that undefinable, ephemeral magic that we seek in architecture beyond its, uh, conf beyond its contributing to the sort of wholesomeness of a shelter. And I'm thinking particularly of those buildings which have uh, a higher calling, a place of worship, a memorial, uh, even a civic building, an institution of importance. And there, there is another question of how do you achieve this sense of uplift, something that is memorable, we have terrible words for that today. Uh, the good words are, or well, at least the words that we understand are, the iconic factor. Is this an iconic building? I'm not fond of the word, and I'm much less fond of where is the wow factor. But, <laughs> but I guess I do understand that in seeking the wow factor, uh, if it's not just the, sensational, the sensation for the moment, we are seeking something that stays with us, that uplifts us. And that, of course, is what we struggle to achieve, each architect in his own way. So I would say, and that I think is important to say, that if the wow factor has been achieved at the expense of compromising all these other things I spoke about, the materiality, the economy, the efficiency, the sort of sense of the building's program, then we have not succeeded. It has to be a resonance, a coming together of all of this. And so in presenting the projects, I'm going to uh, relate to three th themes that have been very central through the work. The first is humanizing megascale, dealing with density, housing, the growing, the, the, the expanding and changing form of cities. The second is reinventing or uh, uh, designing for the public realm. And the third is searching for the uniqueness of place and program. So, let me see how we do this. So I'll start with a few, today they are maybe depressing slides to look at, but this is the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of the century. High-rise buildings are coming up and architects are struggling about what's the form of cities how are we going to have new ideal cities? Uh, this is Le Corbusier uh, in the 1920s, an ideal city called La Ville Radieuse, the radiant city. And the notion was we want to have high-rise buildings, we put them in green space, and we put highways that can move the traffic rapidly between them, and that's the city of the future. Next. And uh, as these utopian conceptions have a way of doing, they trickle into daily life, and by the, by the 1950s, we're building these utopian cities, and this utopian city happens to be Stuyvesant Town in New York. When I was in the last year of School of Architecture, I went on a trip, a scholarship trip to study housing in North America. These are images from that trip. Uh, Public housing in every American city was now emulating that diagram in a pretty depressing way. But we were seeing the emergence of the apartment building as the dominant building block uh, in, in dense urban environments. And in contrast, we were studying Ebenezer Howard, the garden city, the ideal city, and that, I would say, led to the suburbs. And in the suburbs, we, uh, we visited Levittown. It was new and fresh at the time. Uh, you could see the kind of response, dispersal, low density, each seeking their own home. 
Uh, and when I was a student just graduating, the ideal building that everybody emulated was Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation, built right after the Second World War as a sort of ideal apartment building. And I, as a student, reacted that he had sold out in this structure all the ideals of what I was calling a garden for everyone and a sense of openness that high-rise construction should be seeking. And so this leads from my uh, graduation thesis to Habitat, in which I tried to develop a plan for a high-rise structure in which every house has a garden, there are streets and not corridors, uh, they are, the units are prefabricated, piled up in a way that forms gardens for every house. They are prefabricated and, and, and installed in the factory uh, to achieve economy. Uh, these are streets flying in the air, leading you to your apartment. And this is the building today, uh, 45 years later, almost 50 years, now a, uh, uh, a registered building in terms of... Uh, the heritage, and no one can change it or touch it. And as you can see, it's uh, being used very happily. Uh, many of the original residents and two, two generations down still living there. In 73, uh, 1973, I went to China and traveled uh, the country. And all major cities which we visited, this happens to be Beijing, were, um, were basically carless, and there wasn't a single high-rise building in any of them. There was the Bund, which were just a few uh, 10 or 15-story buildings in Shanghai, nothing in Beijing. This is a Beijing street. And then I went back some years later. This is Beijing today. Now, this is in my lifetime, in my professional lifetime, a transformation beyond comprehension an urbanization that meant that major rural population has moved into cities. And this is true of Latin America, it is true of Asia, it is true of much of the world. Cities of 20 and 30 million people at densities. And these are densities we didn't even dream about uh, in 1967 when I built Habitat. This is Shanghai, Hong Kong, we could keep going. Not Los Angeles, though. So uh, two years ago, in a research fellowship that I run in my office with students, uh, architects who come and work on some research, we decided to re revisit Habitat and see how, what we would come up with in terms of today. The problems we recognize today, the technology of today, the economics of today, and these were some of the themes we touched on. Fractalization, what does that mean? Uh, the breaking up of a surface, the mathematical breaking up of a surface to expand its perimeter so that it can absorb the most light. Porosity, light penetration, membrane, mixed use. And this is, this is a diagram of what fractalization is mathematically you expand the surface so that it can absorb more light. And we recognize that building high-density, high-rise buildings, and today they are mixed-use and they are at 10 times the densities we imagined then, is all about managing light, the penetration of light and sunlight and openness, and trying to overcome the sense of density that comes with these uh, extraordinary concentrations. These are all the models we made in a period of about nine months, uh, appropriate gestation. And this is one of the several schemes we developed. This one is vertical. It's uh, simpler than Habitat in Montreal. It's all built uh, vertically so that you don't have the, uh, the, the sort of structure complexities. The plumbing lines are running straight. We thought that would achieve great economy. And uh, yet each uh, unit has its outdoor space and public streets and great deal of porosity. And we call this our economy model. It could even make social housing, as they call it in some countries. Uh, we also looked at creating uh, 
kind of hillsides, uh, landscaped hillsides in which people could actually design their own apartment within a space allotted to them within that. And a denser version and so on. And then we went on to a much denser version in which office buildings at the lower levels were capped by apartment buildings above with shopping streets at the base level, uh, all uh, bringing to uh, much higher density and still appear to be airy and livable. Then we decided to take on New York, and the diagram you see on the left is uh, Midtown New York. The red buildings are office buildings, the blue apartments, the uh, yellow retail. And we rearranged this, as you see in this diagram, to the identical density. And so here we had a kind of an openness. If you built this along the East River or Central Park, you wouldn't be blocking the views to those behind you. Uh, and you can see that many of the units still have the gardens. There is a community street at the center uh, and uh, apartment buildings and the public room below it. And what we found is that in the next couple of years, some of these ideas trickled into our real office projects. And so now, uh, under construction in a city called Qingwandao in China, is a residential project of great density. These large openings, uh, which you see here, are openings that permit the development behind to look to the beach uh, on which this is built. This is the China Sea, and you see here the villas, the buildings, and the development behind it, which already is there, able to sort of have a sense of the presence of the openness of the beach. This is middle income housing in Singapore. This is near completion, middle income housing. So one is aware that 40 years later, we are now able to realize some of the concepts of habitat, much denser. You can see the individual gardens, the public recreational space at various levels, that's sort of bridging between the buildings. That's one of those bridges. Very high densities, etc. Which brings me uh, to the second theme, the public realm. So, um, what do we mean by the public realm? I'll I'll make a bit of a take a little bit of a. Uh, Retraction. Uh, this is uh, just a rendering of the Agora in, of the uh, Forum in Rome. And this, the, these were cities that were built for public interchange and interaction. The individual buildings all contributed to creating a public realm. Cities were about the public realm. Uh, this is Athens in the Agora. And I was, it was pointed out to me when I showed that image to a friend about the nature of public space, and they said, well, take note, not a single woman in the picture. So much for the public realm in Athens and so much for democracy, nor were any of the slaves allowed into the Agora. But anyhow, within, within their restrictions, they were thinking of this as the urban room. And we're all familiar with later examples, <clears throat> 17th, 18th, 19th century, Paris, but something interesting started happening in terms of the public realm, which is in different cultures, they try to intervene with climate. So in the hot desert climates, we get the bazaar. It is shaded, it is cool, it is where people gather. The bazaar was not only for shopping, the mosques, the schools, the madrasas, all opened from that main artery of public life. And in Europe, Galleries with glass roofs that would allow day daylight, but also create a controlled climate. This is Milan, of course, were beginning to be invented. And finally, uh, just towards the advent of the 19th century, the Crystal Palace in London, part of the World's Fair, just tried to show maybe a whole city could be climate controlled. And I, I don't have the image 
of Bucky Fuller, who had just covered Manhattan with the dome, and he said, well, all of Manhattan can be climate controlled. <laughs> but again, just like the, the dreams that I showed earlier in terms of utopian solutions led to sometimes not too desirable a solution, this is a public realm dominating most cities today, and that is the mall. And it leaves a lot to be desired. This is another mall, and this is a fancy mall. This is the mall of Dubai. It has a ski run, and it's got, I think it's got a jungle. It's, it's got everything you want, but not culture, mostly shopping and not civic facilities, but that's the, that's the public realm of today. Uh, America has another invention, <laughs> the strip. And even in cities that are growing now in the United States, I've been coming in and out of Bentonville, as I sh shall show later, in Arkansas for the past 10 years, building crystal bridges. And that city probably tripled in the 10 years I was coming in and out of it. It tripled in this form. So about, I think it's now seven years ago, I was asked to design the Marina Bay Sands project in Singapore on this site that you see here, landfill in front of the downtown area. This was landfill area created to, to form a bay in what used to be the harbor, and this was to be the place that Singapore goes out to the world and creates an attraction for tourism and also trying to create a great public space. It was all centered around a casino license, hotels, convention centers, and tourist-related facilities. And when this came in as a, as a project, as a potential project, my wife, Michal, who is here today, said, why do you want to do a casino? And my response was that the casino is part of it. It forms 5% of the project. But this is an opportunity, given 10 million square feet of mixed use in the downtown. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It's good to have a daughter that worries about you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that this is an opportunity to create the public, a public realm that becomes an example of what a downtown can be. You see across there the project on the other side of the bay, just the model in this case. Next. And we were working here in unison with a planning agency, city planning agency, the Urban Renewal of Singapore, who really had the public realm on its mind. In Singapore, planning is decades ahead of anything I know, either in Europe or in the United States. And they had charted this path along the water, which they wanted to become a completely open to the public promenade, landscaped and developed, including cultural facilities, commercial facilities, civic facilities, so that it becomes a real open, inviting, mixed, um, mixed in terms of the sort of social spectrum of the city place. And our project, as you can see, is a pivotal section of it. And so I knew that if we can build upon that objective and organize our project accordingly, we will maybe show that there's a new kind of public realm that can be created. This is the model. Uh, I'll explain it. Don't get overwhelmed. Some of you might have already been there. Uh, but you can see in the foreground a promenade that extends along the water. You see a museum of arts and science, which was part of our program on the promontory, and cafes and shops, uh, a plaza for events. You can see also above it, on the roof of the buildings, public promenades which are accessible and then the hotels rise behind it, and then a sky park hovering over two and a half acres of sky park on top of it all. But going back to first principles, the inspiration for the plan in Singapore was the Jerusalem Madaba plan. This is a Byzant plan of a mosaic of 
Byzantine Jerusalem that chose the Cardo Maximus, like any Roman city, it had its, its main spine, the gates of the city, and all the main public buildings plugging in to that spine of urban life. And so I thought if I take the promenade, and if I take the sort of air-conditioned environment we normally call the mall, and integrate them into a new outdoor, indoor being, which is not only commercial, but also civic and cultural, we might have an interesting place where you can be indoors, you can be outdoors, depending on the weather, depending on the day, depending on the hours of the day. And that translated into a cross-section, which allowed activities, shopping, outdoor, indoor, all to be integrated, connected to the mass transit, to the trains, etc., as well as to parking. And the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that supported all of this, running along the water, and the, you see here in the model, the piazza for public events of 20,000 people mandated by the government with its platforms that can go up and down and actually adjust to become an amphitheater or a flat space depending on the needs of the moment. And that, of course, translates into the different functions aligning along. And the sketch that shows that the garden idea or the gardens, the promenade, is occurring at every level, along the water, on the roof of the structure, and again on the roof of the high-rise structures. And here we are on the promenade, along the water, and then moving inwards, and you see the crowds and the people mixing, and you walk there and you see that the entire city is actually using it. The shows late at night, shade over the structures to accommodate the fact that this is in the tropics, and you want transparency, but you don't want to let the sun in. And then moving through to indoors, many levels of shopping, and then on to the roofs. And the hotel lobbies as well form a major public promenade open to the public 24 hours a day. And then there was the roof, the sky park. I've been asked many times, how did you come up with the idea of the sky park? It actually happened in a day, in a, during the design, we had a large model, we had three towers, we were sort of arranging the facilities and the different program, and, and we realized we have swimming pools, we have gardens, we have jogging paths, we had no more space, it was just all packed. And it was a very large piece of wood, balsa wood, that was in the model shop, and I took it and I put it on the roof and I said, there it is, it's very simple. It took some doing after the simple. <laughs> but this is two and a half acres of swimming and park and observatory, and it's transformed the city. Uh, and everybody goes there. If you're a hotel guest, you can do this. But if you're the public, you can do that. And sometimes they sneak in. And the museum was also mandated by the government out of an insistence that culture should cohabit with commerce. And we invented the notion of a museum of art science that brings the arts and the sciences together. There it is, you could see the galleries, light coming from above, very versatile. They have many, many exhibitions. The whole roof drains onto, into the interior the water comes right through the building and then is collected and recycled into the project. And here are the galleries uh, in the making and in final form and looking through to the city from under the museum. I want to touch on one more building which dealt with the public realm because I want to emphasize that the public realm does not end in the street that the public realm actually is an issue every time we design a building that has, I mean, it's true of the skirball, it's true of libraries, it is true of most museums. In what way do they contribute to the public realm? And 
I just want to remind ourselves what the image of library was, say, when Carnegie was building uh, libraries in every city of America uh, a century ago. This is a Widener Library at Harvard, but it is like all 19th century libraries, could have been the library in New York, opaque, a bit forbidding, certainly not very inviting, kind of an elitist place of scholarly endeavor. And uh, the reading room is, of course, very ceremonial, and we have this extraordinary uh, tradition of what libraries are all about. But when I came to do the Salt Lake Library, um, there was a notion that a public library, this was our second library, we had already done the li library in Vancouver, should be outreaching. It should have something called the urban room. This was their master plan, which was strange because it showed a library number 11 and a public piazza number 10. And in the life of me, I couldn't quite figure out how would anybody leave the wide streets of Salt Lake that are around this block and get into number 10 and make it a wonderful public space. Next. But this was a diagram that emerged when we started working on the site. This is the library and urban room hassles here, uh, contained by this great crescent wall which has along its shops and cinemas and so on, hugging this piazza, which then is accessible from transit and parking. And the roof is a reading garden open to the public who can enter it from the library or also climb up the wall and come and enjoy that park as part of the extension of the city streets. The plan that shows all the facilities. And then I was asked, how, how do you know that people are going to climb up that wall and go all up there? What, give us a precedent. We need a precedent. Well, luckily, I had a slide from the 73 trip to China. I was there, by the way, a few weeks ago, first time on the wall since then. There wasn't a single khaki uniform, I should say. Things have changed in China. Uh, and it was as colorful a scene of Chinese tourists going up and down that you could imagine. So things change. But this is our walkway, no soldiers either. And we should have figured out how the kid could look out without climbing. But And the roof, which is a place people go to with a book or just to walk around or sit overlooking the mountains. And the great crescent wall hugging the piazza. But I want to show you the kind of activities that happen in that urban room. Uh, it's a place that's open from early morning to very late at night. There are gatherings such as this. They are, this is the, uh, sorry, we, this is the uh, teens library where they climb up their own private stair to a secluded place. Very successful, too successful. Looking down on the piazza. And the transparency of the building as you move around it from the piazza coming in and the kind of activities that take place there. Concerts, so on and so forth. So we made it to Archie. And, you know, there is in the library and he says, this is, I can't read it, maybe you can. I, but at the end, he says, wow, wow, put a third wow for me. That's the greatest library, whatever. <laughs> OK. So we'll change pace a bit. And the last three projects are about place. They're all very distinct places. One of them you're sitting in uh, is the Skirball Center. And then I want to show you Crystal Bridges, which was, as I will explain, born at the Skirball. And then finally, Yad Vashem, which was maybe the most difficult assignment I ever had to take on. So let's start with uh, our story here. We already established it was a garbage dump, but there's a proof. And what I want to emphasize is how the plan evolved, why it evolved, what, what sort of fed into the ideas of it. So you just instead of just walking through, there would be some explanation of why. 
Um, this site had many specials, uh, California specials, as I like to say. This is a mudslide. That's a mudslide. We were told you can't build here and you can't build where we are right now because that's in a, just up there is a mudslide. And also this is a fire hazard, so you have to be 30, 40 feet away. And then there's a fault somewhere, I'm not sure where. So, and I suppose that's a typical California site. So, uh, this is a topography of the site. And we knew that if we wanted to create the kind of campus, we couldn't have just one f concentrated building in the center. It would mean a one building institution. That's not what the Skirball is about. That's not what California is about. One of our slogans was, for every room we create, we want an outdoor room next to it. For every building or pavilion, a courtyard or a garden next to it. And so this plan of multi-pavilions, which was done 30 years ago, and basically, basically held as a diagram, fits into the land. We found a way to build in the mudslides. We stabilized the hill. Uh, we created uh, a museum building that we call the dam building, so it could restrain the mud when it felt. And that became an amphitheater. Some of you might have visited. And then that's the first phase and the second phase. And so there is the plan that was generated by the topography of the site and its structure. And you see how it hugs the land and fits into it, which gives it its richness where you walk and get a surprise every time you move from one space to the other rather than a more regimented experience. And then there was a question of the palette of the building, and we decided to build it with stone inlaid concrete. Concrete for structural, for strength, for economy, inlaid with stone, so that there would be the warmth and richness of it. When the walls were curved, we had mostly concrete and, and stone bands. When the walls were straight, we had mostly stone with concrete bands. And we roofed them with stainless steel to reflect the sky and read nicely in terms of the dark, vegetation of the mountains around it. And then indoor and outdoor. Everywhere we had an indoor space, we had an outdoor space with the walkway that separates us from the mountain. And what became the barrier for the fire hazard became this wonderful sculpture walk. And the amphitheater and the courtyards and all that goes on in them. Alice Walton came to Skirball incognito. If Uri knew, he would have toured her. <laughs> but he didn't know. She came incognito. She was sent here by the Huntington Library. She said she wanted to build a museum of American art in Bentonville, but she wanted to be more a place of the community. She wanted to be a community center as much as it is a museum. And they told her at Huntington, you should go to Skirball. I think that's what they're all about. And she came here. And she then went to the Peabody Essex Museum, which I designed in Salem. All of this incognito. And then there was a phone call. Uh, would I come uh, and spend the day with her in Bentonville, which I did. At the end of the day, having toured the potential site, not yet a, a specific spot on that site, as I was leaving for the airport, I said, you're going to go about selecting an architect. How are you going to do it? Thinking competition, interview, you know what we go through as architects to get a job. And she said, no, I'm ending it tonight. And that was it. So it was a nice beginning. Um, but I make the connection because we talked about client and architects before. How many clients make a point of going to visit the work of the architects they're considering before selecting them? That's a, you'd be surprised how many interview and look at pictures but don't go to see the work. It seems to me that's the only way to understand what a, an architect is doing. Well, this is the family estate and this is downtown Bentonville. And I don't want your fantasies to be overstressed about downtown Bentonville. <laughs> But you can walk the trail beautifully to the museum, and I decided to put the museum in the ravine, right deeply in it. The tops of the hill 
were beautiful, mature trees. I didn't want to cut them. And when I said I want to put the museum in the ravine where the stream bed is and the, and the, and the crystal springs is, uh, I was reminded that it's uh, under the control of the Corps of Engineers and it is a floodplain, uh, which was true. Um, and here is that stream after we've cleared the brush and trees in the valley, that's where I didn't want to build. And uh, once we succeeded in convincing everyone that we could take care of the floods, and we could take care of the Corps of Engineers. I don't know which was more difficult. And there was an interesting discussion. This is the site like with water when it's not raining. When, when it rains, it's a flood. And this is a sketch I made of thinking of two dams that would create two ponds by just trapping the stream water and building a museum around them. There it is built. Uh, but uh, it's a good, good story about the floods. Uh, I thought 100-year flood, so we would raise the buildings above the flood level. And then there was a whole discussion. There's very precious art in the building. What about a 500-year flood? Cut a long story short, it ended up being the 3,000-year flood. So I said, push it another 50 years, we'll have the Noah flood. <laughs> But that is a 3,000-year flood, so. And we've had a couple of good ones so, uh, since the building was completed. But basically, you see the two buildings that act as a dam, but they're also bridges. The roofs are bridges, and they span across the water. Uh, this is the reception entry building and restaurant. These are galleries coming all the way around. This is the Great Hall, it's the equivalent of this room for events and so on curatorial wing, you come from above, you descend into the ravine, and you move through this entire environment. The entire structure is made of wood harvested in Arkansas, laminated wood beams, not unlike what some of you might have seen last night in Hersher Hall, and uh, for vertical structure, inlaid concrete, like the skirball, but inlaid with wood. The roofs are copper. And here you see that bridge building spanning across the ravine. And these are mock-ups of getting high technology, very efficient structures out of the local wood laminated in new ways, taking a available material, harvestable material, and stretching it to its limit. And the concrete walls with wood inlay. And you come above and you descend, and there are courtyards and you arrive in the main social space, which I should say, like the Skirball, is really active day and night, weekend, and I, I mean, 600,000 visitors in the first year. And you're looking out towards the surrounding museum, and it's open, and, and all of it seems accessible and legible. The galleries, wood ceilings, warming the place, the ravines going through, sculpture, indoor and outdoor. And these are galleries which bring light from above, soft light, and bring you this extraordinarily even light that conserv conserves love so that you can see the work in daylight without threatening the art. And when it rains, it's like a waterfall uh, coming under the building. Contemporary art, and always connecting to the outside, and the trails becoming part of the life of the community all around, leading to the downtown. I'll conclude with Yad Vashem, because Yad Vashem, in every respect, its program, its purpose, and its site, demanded thinking fresh. And you will see that the architectural response in Yad Vashem, how many, I can't see much, but how many have been to Yad Vashem? Oh, wow, okay, that's easy. Um, so my story with Yad Vashem starts, actually when I, just about when I met Uri, 
in the mid-70s, I was asked to design a memorial museum for the children who perished in the Holocaust. And I made a proposal uh, which was to make, well, first I tried to design a museum and I spent many weeks in the archives of Yad Vashem and saw what they had that is connected with children, the letters, the, the things that, that survived. But I felt very uncomfortable as you emerge from the historic museum to have yet another museum with information. I felt that people would be saturated having come from the main museum to the memorial. And so I proposed something much more abstract, a place of contemplation. Uh, you would come to this place of a natural cave on the site and you would descend into it. Uh, you come into the ground to a space created under the hill. There is a anteroom with just photographs reflecting of some of the children who died. And then you come to one great space with a single candle in it, reflecting into infinity in all directions through a series of optical reflective walls that makes it just go into infinity. And a voice reads the name, and then you emerge into light again. Yad Vashem rejected the design, uh, saying, it's too abstract, people will misunderstand, kids will think it's a disco. And it sat there for 10 years, and in 86, Abe Spiegel, who was a Los Angeles survivor who owned some banks, came to Yad Vashem, saw the model which was still there. He had lost his two-year-old son on the selection line in Auschwitz, and he said, build this, and he wrote a check. And as things go in Israel, there's a check they build. It's an interesting story because the, a visit by the Prime Minister of Punjab to the Children's Memorial led to my doing the Museum of the Sikhs because he was very moved there. He asked to meet me. And in the exhibition, you'll be able to see the Museum of the Sikhs that came out of this Children's Memorial when, when the Prime Minister of Punjab was there. But some years after, Yad Vashem decided to totally rebuild the historic museum. Many of you know the story. Once Washington was built, the, the museum in Washington, Yad Vashem, in terms of information, was obsolete. And it wanted to do a comprehensive presentation that would cover all the information on the Holocaust. That would be three times the size of the old historic museum. And there was a competition, international competition, three phases. They couldn't make up their mind. And eventually, uh, we were selected to do that. So going back, this is the site. Many of you know. In fact, in this photograph, you can still see the historic museum. Uh, and that's the Hall of Names, which we kept. And I thought to put a building three times the size of that on this, building, on this hill, on this memorial hill, on this pastoral environment, is really um, not the right thing to do. And I kept thinking in terms of a building that cuts through the mountain, that comes in the mountain on the side of the entry and emerges on the other side, so the entire museum is in the ground. And you can see here in another sketch, literally entering the mountain here, the, the gallery is under the mountain and then coming to the light at the other end. And as you do, moving in a zigzag way from gallery to gallery, a kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but struggling to get to it until you went through the entire narrative. And the reason, one of the reasons I want to put the building underground is that I wanted to make not architecture, but something almost like a quarry. This is a quarry, by the way, in Spain, which was an inspiration for the building, but an archaeology, or some of you might have visited the caves of uh, Qumran, where you have a non-architecture that's buried in the mountain, either from made of the rock or, or made of concrete. And there it is, cutting through the mountain as we got it built. You come in, uh, and then you pass through, going from gallery to gallery. You can see the skylights popping out of the mountain uh, where the light is coming into the galleries. And then returning to the memorial hall, 
and then from there over the crest to the children's memorial. Now, I thought there should be a service building, one in which you enter and you can leave your, your, your stuff and you can have refreshments and there's a, a gift shop. And um, I thought that this should be kind of a place a bit like a sukkah. Uh, the light comes from above, uh, it comes through a trellis, it becomes all striped, there's sort of the shadow and, shadow and light pattern, and I thought this would kind of be a purifying moment before entering the galleries. And I want to reflect on the whole issue of symbolism because uh, many architects are fond of sort of telling the public what their symbolic moves are, so let's, let them not miss the point. Uh, once I walked in here and I saw a guide with a group and he says, and the architect wanted you to feel like the prisoners so that when you come in, stripes are all over you and these are the uniforms of the camps. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> and actually many stories like that go around Yad Vashem, some of which I could predict, this one I did not predict. <laughs> Next. So you cross a bridge, you sort of leave the, the, the city and you cross that bridge. The bridge is kind of a little shaky, not as shaky as I wanted it to be. The engineers got nervous. Uh, and then you enter the, the main historic museum. And you move down, the, the floor descends. It's all concrete, there's no stone, there's no pretty materials, it's just concrete and the exhibits. And the whole building is concrete and some skylights and nothing else. There is no architectural detail whatsoever. The floors are concrete. Everything is concrete. And the black and white photographs merge into the gray concrete seamlessly. And as you move through, um, you come to these cracks in the floor which you cannot cross, and that streams you through uh, as you are stopped into the galleries. And as you descend, the source of light gets higher and higher because you're getting deeper and deeper into the ground. And what fascinated me, these are photographs taken by my wife Michal uh, of the people at Yad Vashem, is how at some point the exhibits and the people merge. Uh, this photograph particularly, uh, the entry to Auschwitz, this is, the woman is not part of the photograph. She is a survivor who is visiting Yad Vashem. The Hall of Names culminates the exhibit before you exit. It is the, surrounded by the files of the three million names that Yad Vashem, Yad Vashem have assembled. Above is a cone with images from these files. And below, cut into the natural bedrock, is a counter cone in the natural bedrock, in memory of those whose names will never be known. Which you see here, looking up to the faces and the names, and then looking down, looking up, and looking down, natural bedrock all the way to the water table, where the faces from above reflect. And then you exit to a courtyard, it breaks itself out of the mountain into this moment where you reach the view of Jerusalem and the forest. And I want to pause here and just uh, recall the intense discussion, a discussion of month about this final piece of Yad Vashem, part of Yad Vashem. I felt that coming out of there, breaking out of the mountain, Seeing this forestation would give a sense of renewal. Life prevailed. We are here. There was a great debate. It's too optimistic. It connects the Holocaust to Israel. You wouldn't believe the discussions. In any event, the concept prevailed, and we've built it. And you go there now, and you just watch the people's faces, and you know that we did the right thing. Thank you. So, I'd like to uh, conclude 
with a little bit of a summary. I'm very often asked, what inspires you as an architect? And you know, you can talk, think of buildings that you visited, places, cities that you visited. But I think in a final analysis, I think that what inspires me is really most is studying nature's designs. This is the wing of a dove, the bone structure of the wing of a dove. You can see the most beautiful lattice uh, to get strength with minimum material. This is the nautilus. Uh, the animal needs to grow in proportion to its body, and the spiral, logarithmic spiral, is the only way mathematically it can do so. Or the case of trees that transform seasonally from absorbing light to preserving energy just for survival. Think of architecture transforming from season to season as beautifully as trees. And the spider web, which is the most efficient tensile structure, most beautiful pattern, is the only way a spider could actually go from point to point and weave this in terms of the lattice of, uh, of, of the three-dimensional surface. And these examples of nature show how evolution, through natural selection, achieved extraordinary fitness. And that sense of fitness is what we should be seeking in architecture. Think of a window that functions like our eye. The pupil expands, it shrinks, depending on the amount of light we can see at different times. There's so many things that happen to the eye. Think of that level of richness and complexity applied to architecture. So if we talk about the potential of technology, it's not just to make extraordinarily complex forms. Technology can give us today the possibility of achieving fitness that's more akin to design in nature. And I want to conclude in a poem which I wrote some years ago uh, to, in conclusion of my book, Form and Purpose, which I read in this room on the occasion of the EG conference. I think it's about 10 years ago in this room. So uh, there it goes. He who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through nature, the nature of the universe and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Thank you very much.